There we are. All right. There, that's better. And uh, we better share our desktop. And there. Share. All right. And that should do it. Slideshow. Used to F5. <laughs> And uh, okay, and sometime today, please tell me you're going to do it. No, I mean, it's a little the ball. Let's see. Next to the Zoom slide. Okay. Go with that protected view. Enable editing. That guy right there. Oh, that one. Okay. Oh, okay. So there we are. I don't use uh, PowerPoint. I use Libre. I use Libre. Okay. Really happy to be here today. Talk to you about fiber optics. It's something I did my almost my entire career, and uh, it's really fascinating. And you're going to get a view that probably a lot of people um, don't have because I did a lot of research on the internet to try to find a lot of information, and I was able to stitch a lot of it together. Um, but there's not really been a lot of documentation and mostly because it's done by a limited number of companies. And a lot of it is um, somewhat trade secrets, but I'm not gonna reveal any of the trade secrets today. I'm gonna to just talk about the generalities of it and how it works. So why I talk about um, fiber optics here? Well, it is, well, you know, light is part of the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see the visible light up at uh, 430 to 750 terahertz. Uh, we're usually down in the radio frequency spectrum, 30 to three gigahertz, but it's still on the same thing in the basic physics apply, um, no matter what frequency we're talking about. So um, I thought it might be interesting just to you know, broaden your perspective a little bit about uh, what we think of radio waves. It's also light waves. So how'd this start? Well, a guy named Daniel Colodon first described a light fountain and he made a tank and basically put light into the tank and then he punched a hole in the side of the tank and the water came out in a stream and lo and behold, in the bucket that the light was going, the, the, the water was going into, the light was going into the, the bucket too. So the idea that water can transmit light through internal re reflection was demonstrated back in 1884. Where, pardon? What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. The article was written in 1884. So, um, where you might have fiber in your house is if you have a TV with a sound bar, you might have an optical um, connection, the 5.1 channels of sound transmitted from your TV to your soundbar. And you may, you know, it'll say optical in. And, you know, if, you, if you're having problems with a neighbor maybe, and he's hearing your radio on his speakers, on his surround sound, and he's not using an optical fiber to transmit the signal, that might be a solution you could work with him on. Where do we see it in fiber optics? I mean, in uh, ham radio, optical fiber. Well, ICOM makes a super multi-bander transceiver system, the IC900A slash IC900E, and the remote controller is actually connected with the fiber optic cable for interference-free communication. So I guess it's kind of like one of those panels that are detached from the radio. Uh, of course, you're going to use fiber anytime you're on the internet. So anything that's voice over IP uh, is going to be D-Star, DMR, Fusion, Echo Link, those sort of things, any kind of linked repeater system that uses the internet is going to be using fiber. Um, all your internet sites, you're going to be use fiber. WinLink email system, you're going to use fiber. In general, all the e internet email cell towers, data centers, most likely you're, you're going over fiber. Um, so it's everywhere. So you should know how it works. Um, other applications of fiber is used in night vision goggles. Uh, we're it's work, uh, you can work in, uh, in tactical field cable. We worked on helicopter deployable cable that just laid down under a helicopter as it flew across 
a battlefield. Fiber guided missiles were something worked on. So the missile paid out of the back of the fiber back to a controller and it couldn't be jammed. Um, you know, radiation resistant fiber, EMI resistant fiber, anywhere there's a large campus. And then you have your other medical endoscopes, mechanical inspections, main use of telecommunications. My first fiber optics was when my father's Riviera, Buick Riviera, it had three lights over each corner of the hood, a blue, uh, a yellow, and I think a red, and the fibers ran down to the lights. So if your parking lights were on, <laughs> the yellow illuminated. And if your regular lights were on, the white came on, and then the blue came on if you had your high beams on. So first, first application of fiber optics. So there are plastic fiber optics. Mostly those are gonna be your low cost, very short distances, larger in size, easy to connect, uh, safer and that they won't shatter and get under your skin. Glass fiber is gonna be much pure, communication grade. They're harder to connect because they're small and they're needle sharp and brittle. So we can't really have the kids playing around the fiber optics. Fiber optics are made of glass and the light carrying part, the glass part is the size of a human hair. The structure is there's a core where the light travels down the, the middle. The cladding is used mostly to perform the internal reflection. And then there's usually a jacket of some sort to protect it from impact. How pure? If the ocean was as pure as the glass in a fiber optic, you can see the bottom at seven miles. That's very, very pure. Okay, so we got this round thing, it's made of glass. We wanna put, put a signal down it. Well, we got a problem because some of the light's gonna go straight down the middle. Some of the light's gonna bounce a little bit. Some of the light's gonna bounce a lot. We were trying to put in four discrete symbols of ones and zeros. And if, if it all blurs together, they all look like ones. So that's a problem. So what did we do about that? Then we had to slow down the light in the middle. And how we did that, we used chemicals. So we changed the index of refraction. So light that goes down the middle slows down. The light that's bouncing gets to go faster. And in the end, it all gets to the receiver at the same time. So how fast can we go? Well, a multi-mode fiber band, bandwidth, um, you can see we started in 1989 at 100 megabits per second, up to one in 1998, 10 gigabytes per second in 20, 2002, and up to 100 gigabytes in 20, 2009, 2014. We're up to um, about that, um, but we're using four different wavelengths. So back to basics. Why is the sky blue? Anybody know? Oops. It has to do with the wavelength being reflected off the of atmosphere. Right. That's right. Blue, blue light scatters more. Blue light scatters more than red. That's why when the sun comes down and you see more light coming directly at you, that's red light. That's why the sunset looks red. And in, in the day, if you look up, it's all blue. And it's kind of why it looks that way. So why is that important? Well, it means that the color of light, the wavelength of light that we use is gonna propagate differently within the glass. So we have this thing called relay scattering and uh, light that gets scattered doesn't go down the glass. <clears throat> Even what you see here, the 4%, when we get out to 700 nanometers, that's still too much for communication loss. Um, we need to use light that's beyond what our eyes can see, way out there. So where are the sweet spots? Well, there's a few things going on. Um, at first, we operated fibers in 0.8 um, 
or 800 nanometers, just past red, and we had a loss of 3 dB per, per kilometer. 3 dB means half the power is lost. So over a kilometer, we were losing half our power. That was the first. So we needed repeaters every 10 miles to bump the signal back up because our, our length allowance was like 40 dB. Second generation, we moved that, five, that frequency out to 1.3. And um, today our fiber operates at 1.55, which is the very lowest peak there you see on that red line. The red part, well, that peak there at 1.38, that is actually caused by the OH radicals that are in the glass. They resonate and absorb energy. So actually having OH radical in the glass was something we had to work on to get that down. So if you have repeaters under the ocean and you have to replace batteries, the further you can go is a big deal because it's expensive and difficult to raise a fiber, a cable out of the sea. Then we transitioned. We went from multi-mode to single mode. How do you do that? Well, you just make the core so small, there was only one way. There was only one path. So all this stuff about the getting the pulses to line up again, we kind of got rid of that. Now, the downside of that, it's hard to couple it up because now the part that's going to cover the, it's going to con conduct the glass is now eight microns. Eight microns, 125 was this hair. Now you're talking about the core point is now eight microns. Uh, okay, so you can do that, but how do you line them up? How do you line two of them up to get eight microns together? These were all the challenges. So again, how far can you go? It depends on the signal quality you're trying to maintain. We, me we actually measure the in, or in terms of fiber quality and bandwidth and uh, uh, megahertz kilometers. So the further you go, the less bandwidth you have. So you can see here that the core size has changed or are different sizes, I should say, from six, 62.5 to 50 down to eight or nine microns. And you can see the relative distances in the different grades of fiber. So up to now 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles. What does it take to do uh, your high definition television? You can see that you're gonna need the fibers that are the OM3s, OM4s, and the OS2s to get that far out. So how do you make something like this? Was well, it done on a lathe to start with? So we take a tube of glass and we run chemicals down the tube and through a process known as thermophoresis, the chemicals are deposited on the inside layer of the tube. And um, that can change the refractive index. Now, one of the problems with that is these chemicals are have to be in gas form and the chemicals are silicon tetrachloride, germanium tetrachloride. And the problem with that is you want the silica to stay, which means the chlorine's got to go somewhere. So chlorine combines with the uh, H2O and you're going to get hydrochloric acid in your controllers. So the controllers that are processing this material through are actually being degraded by the material going through them, which makes calibration of those devices a real challenge. You almost have to control the degradation of the mass flow controller as part of the process. So there's a picture of a optical fiber preform, probably kind of in the early days because they're much bigger now. But you get the idea, uh, of course, clean room environment, and you've got a torch that goes back and forth, laying down or allowing the, the chemicals to be laid down on the inside of the fiber. And they've grown in size. Now you can see they're carted around on uh, big carts, and there are some factories that now use overhead cranes to move the preforms from one place to another. So a single preform can do over a thousand kilometers that piece of glass right there. Okay, he's got these preforms. Now we need to give them to a fiber. So we build these fiber towers, draw towers. They can be very tall, five, six stories tall. 
Um, and the preform is put into a, a furnace, 1100 degrees C, and it starts to melt. And the, the drop gob, if you will, comes down and uh, has to go through cooling and it needs to be coated. And during the process of pulling the glass, we actually proof test it. So we put 100,000 PSI tensile stress on the glass. It's a lot. Steel is like 70, all right? So this glass is stronger than steel in a tensile pull. It's strong, but it's brittle. That's a, a picture of the a typical furnace. We use a laser micrometer. Between the temperature of the oven and the speed of the draw, that determines the diameter. So we have the laser micrometer. It's watching that, controlling the speed. Uh, we can't change the temperature that fast. We have to mostly manipulate speed. We coat the cup with a UV curable plastic. It goes through a curing oven. And all that has to happen before it hits the first wheel. It's pulled at a mile a minute. A mile a minute. Zing. <laughs> OK. Uh, so in quality control, we have to figure out how, how long the fiber is when we pull it, how much power we lose over a long distance, how well it's going to connect to other fibers. Are there any bubbles in the glass? Because they'll create havoc with the signals. We got the coatings on there properly, because if they're not, fiber might not sur survive the next manufacturing step. And how fast can we send pulses down the fiber without them blurring together? That's really the, the key part. So what we use is an optical time domain reflectometer. It's kind of like radar. We put a pulse down and we wait a given amount of time. And we see how much came back. That's the backscatter. We wait a bit a little bit longer and that tells us what's going on further and further down the fiber. So this is happening at an incredible speed and we get an idea of, are there any things discontinuous in the fiber? Have we got any stressed fiber? Have we got any broken fibers? Um, have we got bubbles? And we read this to find out you know, what's going on. It's also a nice troubleshooter in case someone digs up a cable, we can find out pretty much where they dug it up. There's an example of an optical time domain re reflectometer used by a technician uh, just in a, a central office. And he's, he could be checking to see that uh, a link is, is working where it should be. Um, and if you bend the fibers too much, you can see that too with your, your OTDR. Okay, so now we got finished optical fibers. Um, all right, we can't twist it like we can copper. It's gotta stay straight. Uh, we can't do any splices in a cable because a splice has to have a lot of support. It won't fit inside a cable. We can't do any uh, high stress or compression during manufacturing because that'll affect the light carrying capabilities. And as a finished cable, we don't want it seeing stress. We don't want the glass seeing stress once it's installed. So we have outside plant, plenum and riser. Plenum was the yellow, riser is orange. Uh, we have data cables and we have drop cables. I'll go through each one. Outside plant, we have the black UV inhibited polyethylene plastic jacket, a corrugated armor. They actually test, they used to test this armor by taking two gophers, a male and a female in the proper time of the season and putting them in opposite cages and seeing how long the cable would survive with, the, with them. Yeah, they stopped that. They, they figured that was kind of cruel and they don't do it that way anymore. But that's the way they rodent tested. Um, Kevlar layers for tensile strength. Kevlar is a great material, high modulus, uh, very strong, very lightweight, doesn't collect, conduct electricity. We have water blocking in there. It could be gel, powder, tapes, keep water from running into a, through a broken cable to the electronics would create a lot of problems. We color code the tubes so we know which ones are hooked together on each side. And um, then we have a strength member there that we use to secure it uh, in these splice housings. You see these, these cylinders that are up on the, the poles, those are splice housings, and you wanna tie off your strength members inside them uh, just to give it stability. Then the indoor riser, similar to outside plant, but you don't have to worry about water blocking because it's all inside. It's a flame retardant PVC plastic. We talked about the colors already. Data cables, now these are crazy. Uh, they, this has kind of come on since I've left the industry and that's 
uh, we have ribbons and the sample I have there are 12 fibers in each ribbon. You can actually splice all 12 at the same time. Cut them, cleave them, line them up. They're arc welded together and you put a protective sleeve over. You can, if we have time, I'll show you the video of that. But these fiber counts are insane. 96 fibers up to 3,456 fibers. And that's where your, your data center comes in. They're the customers that are installing these cables. Drop cables. This is what, if you have fiber to the house, this is what would be in your front yard, something like this. Uh, could be aerial or burial, buried, usually two fibers. Uh, one for going, coming in, one for going out, the signals, a fiber reinforced plastic. Um, we don't want lightning striking this and get, going into the house. Um, sometimes there is a wire to light for metal detection, but we kind of strip it back from the house so it doesn't go into the house, but you can still put a tone on it and the people can find it. So definitely want to call 911 before you dig. Okay, why are cables stranded? Well, According to uh, physics, basically, if you put a lateral force on a structure, there's gonna be compression and tension. The compression is gonna occur at the side of the force and there's gonna be tension on the opposite side. So we wanna distribute that load equally among all the members of the cable. So that's why it's stranded. That's why a rope is stranded as well. If we didn't strand it, we would just break all everything at the outside and slowly the whole thing would just degrade. So that's why we strand cables to, so they can survive when they're flexed. And that property is called lay length. So it's a specification. It has to do with how we rotate uh, the, the bobbins as they go around the center strength member. So what are the manufacturing steps? Well, first we gotta get ink on the fiber. So we got UV curable ink. They run through a machine and there's a, a ink pot there with a UV light. Um, this is even faster than the uh, the drawing process. This is 112 miles per hour that the, the fiber is inked. Then we put them in to the buffers. Uh, it's like putting them in a, a, a plastic tube. Um, and then we strand them. Now I'll talk a little bit about how that happens. So this is a thing called an extruder. It's kind of like a, I think of it an auger fed screw. And what happens is that it's, it's cooler in the back than it is in the front. So plastic pellets are dropping into the hopper. And this screw is turning. And there's some uh, heaters involved. And the friction involved turns that plastic into a molten plastic. And it's pumped out the end of the machine through a breaker. A breaker plate that catches any impurities that might be in the plastic. There's some screens in there. And of course, we're measuring the, the temperature of the plastic. Now, to make a good cable, this has to be a perfectly smooth flow. Because if this thing is pulsating or something, you're going to get a lumpy cable. Or if it slows down a little bit, it's a problem. So, this is an extruder, and that's getting plastic out. Now we got to get the plastic around the product. So, we use a crosshead. So this essentially causes the plastic to wrap around the, the core of the cable, whether it's copper or anything else. And as it comes through, it's basically putting, making a straw as the cable comes through the machine. And this can be done two ways. So you might see some cable that looks perfectly round on the outside pristine, even though inside it's all ropey, but on the outside it's flat. That's pressure extruded. If the cable jacket looks ropey because what's under it is ropey, that's tube extrusion. So what we did in that case, we made a, it's kind of like, if you imagine a, a, a continuous jacket of a constant length over a ropey material gives you a ropey product. So you have two types of that. Um, okay, then you have the center, which is a steel or Kevlar, uh, reinforced plastic. Steel's cheaper, but it's a problem because it's going to conduct lightning. You wrap the tubes around the core. Now, we can't twist the tubes. 
But when you wrap tubes around the core, it twists them. So what we have to do is we have to untwist the tubes before we twist them onto the core. So we do a neutralizing strander and then it wraps the tubes around the core without twisting. Sometimes we do it and we just go this way for a while and then we go back the other way. So you can either do it as a pre-twist, a pre-untwist or oscillate back and forth. And then the water blocking tape, it's got polyacrylic acid, which is the stuff in baby diapers that swells up. It can present water from running down the cable. Just like in your computer, your hard disk drive has a ribbon cable, or the old ones, I should say. Um, easy to connect. Uh, sometimes they're split. Some of the cables run in, fibers run in different ways. Same kind of principle is done with fiber optics. And this reduces the splicing time, which is a big deal for restoration. So if you're trying to splice 144 fiber cable, and you're trying to line up 144 fibers one at a time, or you're doing 12 ribbons at a time, when the process is just about the same for a ribbon and a fiber, your, your restoration time is greatly decreased with the ribbon. Well, we can't strand ribbons, like we can't make a rope out of ribbons, but we do stack them. But we still got the same issue. If we bend the stack, all the ones on the outside are gonna break. So we have to now rotate the stack. So we pay the ribbons off into a stack, but the machine that pays those ribbons off spins. And this machine is about the size of a, a carnival ride, if you will. These ribbons are big. They're like 15 miles long each, being paid off, tension controlled, stacked and twisted. So you can't get around this. The corner fibers are gonna see more strain. So what we had to do was actually have super duper spin insensitive fibers and put them in the corners to keep that from happening. So what do we test? Well, how long is the cable length versus the length of the fibers? That seems you think it should be the same, right? Well, no, because we have to put extra inside a cable. So when the cable is strained, the fiber doesn't see it. Um, same consideration. What kind of power is lost? Are there any locations with high stress loss? Have you got any breaks? Are the jackets the right thickness? Are they, is everything centered up? Did we do the lay length right? So in summary, I would say it's important we understand how optical fiber works because what happened with Tonga recently, we had that volcano destroyed 50 kilometers of cable and they were out of internet for like two months. And uh, fiber was really their only connection. I know they went to Starlink and they got some communications going again, but the, they really need to get their fiber and they have got a fiber link now. But as ham radio operators, we under, need to understand that, you know, even these cables, although they're well built, they're still subject to damage. And, you know, we could be called upon to supplement that. Um, as far as use, in a ham shack, it's really, they're too complex and too expensive for us to use them. They really don't have any application for us in the har our hobby like that. Um, and fiber, you know, continues to be installed, replacing copper. And definitely, if you're gonna build a tower, you're gonna dig a hole, whatever, call 811, because there's a lot of information going over fiber optic cables. And you don't wanna be the one that, uh, that breaks one or digs one up. So that's a very high level. I try to give you a very high level view of the fiber optics. If you have any questions, I can answer. Nope. Yes, sir. With the screen share, wouldn't the signal fit to an antenna on a tower? A road would be a good application for especially in Florida. Are you having interference problems with no, that? We're doing about lightning. Oh, you, you, want, you want a dielectric solution? Right. It could be. Yeah, there's plenty of dielectric drop cable. Wouldn't you just have Kevlar and, and glass? Now, the, yeah. it may be expensive to buy the two, the two things on the end, but you're going to need LEDs and detectors, you know, to talk back and forth, but you could. Yeah, it might be. You wouldn't have to have glass companies if they were plastic. Probably. Because, you know, you're not worried about uh, 
communications quality. You're just True. Back to communications. You know, uh, it, as much as fiber does, um, fishing line at Walmart is more expensive than a, a fiber of the same length. We do have a question from uh, the uh, gallery. Yes. Uh, Gordon has a question. Sure. Do, do do they really have batteries in the oceans? What are the Ruskies <laughs> likely to do in order to interrupt? I thought there was 900 volt power keeping those repeaters going. Maybe there is in some situations. Um, when I was working in it, we they actually used batteries. So, I'm, they, you know, there could be, yeah, there could be some situations where they do have that. Okay. Well, that's the only question we had on the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to this question. Um, say something on and What's the cheapest way to go about transporting light? We're getting away from our mic here. We're losing our recording too. Yeah. Right. There we go. Let this thing refocus. There you go. Oh, yeah. Well, it might be something to look at. I've often myself wanted to, uh, you know, thought about, well, could I operate, could I isolate Ethernet connections with a fiber optic connection? But I did research and I couldn't find anything that consumers could buy. And now I know why. And yeah. the stuff was probably so expensive, they don't even list it for the average consumer You're to buy. I find it on Amazon. Yeah, well, the fiber is the uh, receiver transfer. Uh, the receiver and transfer. So when it was about, about three or four or five years ago, and I just couldn't find anything. Hmm. I mean, just at, but now, of course, it may be available now, but it wasn't then. So, and uh, someone I understand now because of the, the expense of it. You're not going to find it on Amazon. Well, I think he looked on maybe on eBay too, but it's been some years ago, so I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And uh, that was an awesome presentation. And it looks like we have reached the end of our tracks for today. I want to thank everybody for uh, listening online. And uh, we'll announce this here. Uh, um, as of right now, TechCon 2023 will remain in this weekend slot for now. My understanding is the Bike MS Tour is moving two weeks later. That's what they're thinking at this point. So at this point, we will not move the date, but if they do change their mind, we will let everybody know. So at this time, we're going to end the YouTube stream. Thank you, everybody, for your